Welcome to episode 31 of the Fire Safety Matters podcast, where we bring you the latest news, views and opinion from across the UK's dedicated fire industry. My name's Brian Sims, and I'm the editor of Fire Safety Matters magazine. We're delighted that this podcast is sponsored by the Fire Safety Event, which runs at the NEC in Birmingham on the 25th, 26th and 27th of April 2023. Fire Safety Matters is once again serving as the lead media partner for the exhibition. To register for the show, visit www.firesafetyevent.com. As always, I'm joined on the Fire Safety Matters podcast by my colleague Mark Sennett, the CEO at Western Business Media. Good morning, Mark. How are you? I'm great, Brian. How are you? I'm really well, thanks, Mark. Very pleased with the content in the March print edition of the magazine where we focused on fire alarms and fire detection, uh, software for fire safety and also the construction sector. It's a really great edition, this 108 pages. I'm delighted we'll be taking this issue to the fire safety event at the end of April, of course, who will once again be serving as lead media partner for the show. I've already begun work on the May edition, Mark. We'll be looking at social housing, uh, passive fire protection and the subject of fire risk assessments, which, of course, has been in the news for some time now. And on the social media side of the equation, Mark, last weekend, we surpassed the 8,000 followers total on LinkedIn, and we're enjoying great engagement across all of our social channels, in fact, not least with this podcast. Uh, thank you to all of our readers for your engagement. It's really appreciated. So in short, Mark, everything's going really well at the present. Well, funnily enough, you talk about that social media barrier that you broke through the other weekend. That was the exact opening circulation that we had uh, five years ago when we launched the magazine uh, uh, FSM. So to see that go from zero to 8,000 social media is, is fantastically strong. I mean, it, it's strange for me because obviously I launched Fire Safety Matters and I was editor of it for a long time and, you know, did the sales, etc. And obviously I still have a key sales role on the, the publication. But seeing this edition of FSM, which is the biggest ever, and I don't mean that just purely in revenue, I mean actually in pagination of editorial content too, is something that, you know, we're really proud of. And, you know, huge congratulations to you and to Leanne, uh, who's our sales person on it as well. But, but we can't do it without the engagement from you, the listeners, who, and who are also obviously our readers. So thank you to all of our clients that advertise that, and a big thank you to all of you that engage with it. FSM's reach is growing and growing. These podcast numbers are growing. Our social media reach is growing. Subscribers to our magazine and obviously our e-newsletters are growing too. And uh, later on this podcast, and I'll talk to you about a really new, exciting face-to-face event we're going to be doing too. So, yeah, a lot of work going into FSM at the moment, but something that, you know, we're phenomenally proud of. And like we always say on this podcast, you don't have to wait for this podcast to get all the latest news, prosecutions, products and services. You can go to our website and see it daily. It really is updated daily. Just go to fsmatters.com. Or if you can't remember that, throw into a search engine, Fire Safety Matters, and up we come. It's also worth going there so you can subscribe to the magazine to get it for free. You can subscribe to get our weekly e-newsletter for free there. Or if you click on the webinars tab at the top, you can watch all of our back archive of webinars for free or watch any of our upcoming webinars for free as well. We'll talk a bit more about that later. And you get a CBD certificate with your name on it for attending. You can watch our digital conference on demand there as well. And we also have a jobs board in the Career Hub option. You can see upcoming training courses that you can go to from key associations. And you can see, you know, latest jobs that are on there. And I know currently we've got uh, one for University of Oxford on their job vacancy. So do go take a look at that. You don't need to wait for this podcast to come out. But if you do want to engage with us on this podcast, anything you want Brian and I to cover, just use the hashtag on social media, FSM podcast. So like always, Brian, we start with the news and I'm going to let you lead off with the first news story because it's quite a big one. Fire away. What have you got for us? It is indeed. Thank you very much, Mark. The Fire Sector Federation has just published its new industry benchmark standard for fire risk assessors in order to provide practical guidance for those risk assessors who want to understand the application of fire risk assessment across a range of building types. The overriding aim here, Mark, is to support the delivery of comparable standards right across the sector. The document has been developed by the Fire Sector Federation's Fire Risk Assessors Working Group and identifies criteria reflecting individual competency at three distinct core levels. These are the foundation standard, the intermediate standard and the advanced standard. Further, it goes on to outline increasing levels of skill, knowledge, experience and behaviour to form a competency-based progression route for fire risk assessors. It's a route that signposts a clear pathway for individuals right from entry through continuing professional development and on again to the highest levels of competency that are available. The industry benchmark standard for fire risk assessors document is also unique 
that it seeks to match the three core levels of competency to the fire risk presented in three general types of buildings. Dennis Davis, Executive Officer at the Fire Sector Federation and who leads the Fire Risk Assessors Working Group and also, of course, writes a regular column for us in Fire Safety Matters, commented, the industry benchmark standard for fire risk assessors has been developed to expand and complement our previous work on competency. It supports the need for a systematic assessment of fire risk, followed by the implementation of recommended appropriate controls and mitigation, coupled with the continuous management of fire safety. And Dennis continues, our aim is to raise the professional status of the hugely important work undertaken by fire risk assessors. We also wish to engage with all of those proficient assessors operating without formal or recognised competency assurances in order to help them seek appropriate independent accreditation. The task undertaken by the Fire Sector Federation's Fire Risk Assessors Working Group will shortly move to a new phase of regression mark through the British Standards Institution's new Competence in the Built Environment Committee, that's CPB1, to create a British Standard Code of Practice. As an organisation, of course, the Fire Sector Federation seeks to exert influence on shaping future policy and strategy related directly to the UK's fire sector. The Federation is a not-for-profit, non-government organisation established to act as a forum for the benefit of its membership and also to evolve as a central source of information on all aspects relating to fire safety. Now, copies of the industry benchmark standard for fire risk assessors are available to download by accessing the fire risk assessment section of the Fire Sector Federation's website. This can be found online at www.firesectorfederation, that's all one word, firesectorfederation.co.uk. Now, the subject of fire risk assessment has really been in the spotlight post Grenfell, of course, Mark. What are your views on this one? Well, I'm very familiar with the Fire Sector Federation being a proud member uh, ourselves uh, of that. You know, Western Business Media, which is obviously the publisher of FSM, is a, is a member of FSF and have been for many years, and we really, really support its activity. You know, Dennis, that you mentioned there, is really an unsung hero of that organisation. He's worked tirelessly on this, and, you know, it's fantastic to see the, the fruits of his and the working group's labour come out, and they've been long working on it. So huge credit to the FSF for that. I just really want to add a little bit more from what another member has said um, of FSF, and that's the Institution of Fire Engineers. And they've, of course, welcomed the publication of the Industry Benchmark Standard for Fire Risk Assessment. So the organisation has reviewed the standard and is supportive of its content, which won't come as a surprise to any of you. And it will become central to IFE's own fire risk assessor registration process moving forward, which, in my opinion, is a really good thing. Brian, you, you want to have the highest standards of work and consistency across the sector. So the short answer from my views on it, very supportive. So Steve Hamm, who's the chief executive of IFE, said the Fire Sector Federation's Benchmark aims to raise the professional status of the valuable work fire risk assessors undertake. We echo the Federation's commitment to promoting competency. He also added, a number of our own members have been involved in the competency steering group and the work tasked with developing the principles that underpin this standard. And we've aligned our internal processes to ensure that future applicants join the IFE's fire risk assessor register will be assessed in line with the newly launched benchmark standard. In turn... This will enable those seeking a competent fire risk assessor to benefit from assurance provided by the rigorous IFE registration processes. Long talked about, Brian. Great to see it come into play, is what I would say. And, you know, uh, huge credit to FSF. So I would say that's very much good news. Now, moving into another person that has been almost an unsung hero of this sector, and that is uh, Alex Carmichael uh, from SSAIB, someone that uh, I know very well. Um, th this is both good news and bad news for me in, in terms of mixed emotions. And Alex has announced his retirement. And uh, if you don't know who SSAIB are, they are the Security Systems and Alarms Inspection Board and a, a specialist in UK fire and safety education body. That's, that's who they are. I'm sure everybody knows that. Um, but Alex has been there for a long time, quite a few years now, and he is going to step down in March uh, of this year. And it might be just about while you're while you're hearing this, to be honest, or it may have just happened. So Alex joined SCIB in 2015 when he took over the range of CEO from Jeff Tate. Across the past eight years, Alex has expanded SAIB's scope of UCAS accredited activities and built up the SAIB's 
administration expertise and extended the number and competence of the organisation's dedicated audit team members. As a direct result of those efforts, the SCIB now has a client base in excess of 2,000 companies, which I can tell you is a lot bigger than when he took the reins. So prior to joining SCIB, Alex served as the Director of Technical Services at the British Security Industry Association, the BSIA for short, whom he worked for for a 16-year period. His career also included over 24 years' experience in the British Army in various electronic technical engineering roles within the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. So during his time at SCIB and previously BSIA, Alex sat on a number of British, European and International Standards Committees and will recently chair the Standards Committee for the UK Surveillance Camera Commissioner. Um, you know, I just want to put my personal thoughts on this. I like Alex very much on a personal level. He has been unbelievably supportive uh, as, his, as a leader of his organisation of fire safety matters and security matters. When I came to this company uh, six and a half years ago, uh, Brian, I didn't expect to eventually own it, that's for sure. I came to launch a fire magazine, which you now edit and we now run a podcast on, and uh, to launch the fire safety event. That was my job with the view to hopefully taking over editorial control of the remaining uh, six five publications then at Western Business, as it was known then, Western Business Exhibitions. And coming here, I needed support to do that. I needed to have an audience that was engaged enough that would be interested in the content. And SSAIB kindly allowed us to post copies of FSM, which they still do, um, to, to their approved companies. And Alex greenlit that along with um, Andrew Brown over there and they supported the launch of Security Matters, Brian, in the same way. They took exhibition, they were one of the first people to sign up to exhibition space at the fire safety event. They were the first people pretty much to um, come part of a new conference we're about to announce in a few minutes. Uh, They supported our awards, the FSM Awards. Alex is a judge for the awards. I mean, you know, these guys believed in me, believed in our vision for a publication, more than one in security. And, you know, I wouldn't be where I am um, in my career without the support of good people um, like SSAIB. And, and that was led by Alex. So to Alex, I say, I hope you have a fantastic retirement. I'm so grateful for what you have done to support our publications, our events, and me personally. But more importantly than any of that, I'm very grateful from a sector perspective for the time and dedication and, you know, a lifetime of service you've done to the fire and security sectors after you left uh, the army. So a thoroughly good guy, enjoy his company and, you know, we haven't spent huge amounts of time together we have over the years. Great bloke, um, dedicated to what he what he's done, and if anyone deserves a happy retirement, it's him. But I will miss him, and I'm sure lots of his staff will miss him. Uh, he's a very direct to the point guy, Alex, which I enjoy greatly. You know what you're getting with Alex, and uh, he was never afraid to share an opinion. So yeah, um, a great person, and I'm very grateful to him. And uh, happy retirement, Alex. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Brian. I do indeed, Mark. Commenting on his decision to retire. Alex informed Fire Safety Matters, as I step down and prepare for my next adventure in retirement, I reflect on the fact that in my eight years as Chief Executive of the SSIAB, I've seen this remarkable industry meet many challenges and indeed overcome them. He continued, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the SSIAB's members of staff for their support, and particularly for their can-do attitude, their knowledge, and the proficient manner in which they've carried out their work, which underpins the continuing growth and strength of the organisation. Alex went on to add, I can leave the CEO's chair behind, knowing full well that the organisation I've led has solid foundations in place, a first-class workforce, and a strong and capable management team. I thank all of the SSAB's board members for their help over the years, Chair Jeff Tate for all of his sage advice, and all my industry colleagues over the past 24 years for their help and support. It's been a great privilege and pleasure to lead such a fantastic organisation as the SSAB and to be part of what is a wonderful and ever-evolving industry. In tandem, Mark, the Whitley Bay-based inspectorate has announced that Paul Phillips, who was recently appointed general manager for the organisation, will now be responsible for the day-to-day SSIAB operations subsequent to Alex's departure. Uh, On a personal note, Mark, I've known Alex since the year 2000, when I first became editor of Security Management Today at the Builder Group. Of course, at that time, he was technical director for the British Security Industry Association. 
Alex was a regular columnist for the journal, and I would meet with him at trade shows on a regular basis to discuss the latest updates on standards and indeed best practice. In my view, he did a tremendous job at the Trade Association, has delivered the exact same standards of professionalism during his time at the SSIB. Alex has been a great influencer across both the fire and security sectors, and should be very proud of the legacy that he leaves in place. It's certainly a time of change now, Mark, at both of the key inspectorates, with Richard Jenkins having just vacated the CEO's chair at the National Security Inspectorate. All of us here at Fire Safety Matters and indeed Security Matters wish Alex and Richard all the very best for their well-earned retirements. We're just about to publish issue six of the standard, Mark, and I do hope Alex enjoys reading that document. I genuinely believe it's the best one we've produced to date on behalf of the SSIAB. Well, that's a great example, Brian. It's something I didn't cover because I knew you were going to cover is, uh, you know, Alex and Andrew reached out to us a few years ago and asked if we could uh, help them design and publish the standard, their annual publication. And it's something that we thoroughly enjoy doing with them. Um, caught me off guard when, um, and there's a funny story that I probably won't share in air about how that came about. Um, but it, it, it was, it was, it's a great partnership. It's a partnership I value a lot. And, um, and Alex was right there from all of that. So yeah, I wish him and obviously Richard over at NSI happy retirements. And it's you know kind of strange that they're both moving on at the same time. But, uh, you know, let's regroup now, Brian, and uh, tell us who we've got as our first guest on this episode of the podcast. Our first guest on this edition of the podcast is Warren Spencer, Managing Director of Blackhurst Bud Solicitors and a regular contributor to the Fire Safety Matters podcast. As a fire safety focused legal practitioner, Warren has prosecuted more cases under the regulatory reform of fire safety order than anyone else. In conversation with Mark, Warren looks ahead to a special two hour webinar running on the 2nd of June and examining the ramifications of proposed amendments to the fire safety order. Morning, Warren. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Mark. And yourself? Yeah, all good. Well, we obviously uh, had an interesting day out not so long ago. We went up to uh, Safety Health and Wellbeing Live and did a a mock trial where I was very honoured to be defended by you. And you got me off, Warren. I am now a victor twice. I, I say you got me off in the sense that it was a split jury, wasn't it? But it was a, it was an entertaining event. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. Uh, it doesn't matter how we, we managed to secure your acquittal, Mark. The fact is we secured your acquittal. Uh, a lot of people disagreed with that, but there we are. I can only do my job. And one of the most common questions I get asked is, uh, how do you how would you represent people when you know they're guilty? And uh, uh, this was one of those occasions, I think. Listen, if the glove doesn't fit, you've got to acquit, right? So uh, um, considering the last time we went head to head, you absolutely destroyed me when I was a defendant. So uh, I always love doing these. They're, they're great. They're great fun, the mock trials. And we had over 300 people come to watch that. It was God knows how many standing rows deep. Um, and it, and it, was, it was good fun. And, and we also brought Russ Timpson up there um, as well to talk about um, everything from a fire risk assessor's point of view. And obviously your colleague James Ed was part of it. Just some really good, engaging questions. And, and as you said to me when we were talking off air a minute ago, when you've done that before in training, it's often one that does bring a split result. And, um, and you know, and, and it did again in that situation. It is based on a real life um, prosecution, isn't it? It is. And, and the uh, audience, I saw there was a lot of fire officers there in uniform and in fire inspectors, and um, but also a lot of people from the industry. So uh, maybe that's the reason why. But um, yeah, but then I think that the, the raise, when you ask people to raise their hands, they, it was split again. And when I, when I train on that particular case and I say, you know, what are the views on whether or not this uh, scenario should have been prosecuted? It's 50-50, which I thought, it, which is why I thought it would be a good um, scenario to put forward to the audience and, and <laughs> didn't, didn't resolve the issue at all. No, it didn't. But, you know, another issue that we want to talk about today is... I promised everybody the last time we came on the podcast, we'd have a bit of news about another joint venture that we are doing together. And I'm delighted to say on the 2nd of June, 2023, at 10 a.m., we're going to be doing another one of our 
joint digital conferences with Warren and, and his firm Blackhurst Bud. So Fire Safety Matters are partnering with Warren and Blackhurst Bud solicitors to deliver a two hour webinar, digital conference, whatever you want to call it. And it's on the ramifications of the proposed amendment to the fire safety order. This is particularly topical, Warren, isn't it? And, you know, you can now sign up to come to this webinar. Go to our website, fsmatters.com, or just throw into a search engine, Fire Safety Matters, and click on the webinars tab, and up it comes, and follow our social media too. But, Warren, it is particularly topical. Tell us what we might cover during uh, that digital conference. Well, the amendments that are going to come in through the Building Safety Act are quite quite significant to the fire safety order. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and, and I think also a lot of confusion about the changes this year that have been almost conflated with the the regulations that came in in January, the new regulations. Um, but but they were they are regulations, and they're sort of how you comply with the order. Um, this is the order being changed and fairly significantly in, in quite a lot of areas. Um, in fact, one of, one of the questions I was asked um, on, on the, the day that we did the mock trial um, was that uh, when, when is that going to come into force? When is the Building Safety Act, uh, which is in force, but the particular section, I think it's section 156, um, which amends the fire safety order is not yet in force. Um, and wherever I've looked on the internet to find the answer to this question, um, it, it says that, that the roadmap for the implementation of that particular section is 12 months from the Royal Assent being granted for the Building Safety Act. Well, the Royal Assent for the Building Safety Act was granted on the 27th of April 2022, which would mean that it comes into force on the 27th of April 2023. In, in my view, I think that's highly, highly unlikely because I think um, there would have been much more uh, information put out by the government regarding the, the proposed amendments. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the amendments is going to be Article 9 in relation to the appointment of a risk assessor. Um, uh, first of all, it, it now must be, you know, the, the amendment's going to say that it must be recorded in all instances, not just where the employer employs five or more people, etc. Um, but also that the, the, the responsible person um, is phrased in the negative, must not appoint a person to assist them unless they're competent. In other words, um, there's got they, they're going to have to appoint a risk assessor who is competent. Uh, the difficulty around that is... Well, what does competent mean? Uh, and, and that's something um, anybody who follows this podcast will know that we've discussed uh, in the past. Uh, but th there's still no clarification on that as far as I am aware. I know there is uh, uh, th th there has been information about what competence looks like as far as fire risk success is concerned since about 2011, 2012. But um, th it's got to be a bit more specific than that for the purposes of legislation to be enforced. And as far as I'm aware, there is no information out publicly about what competence looks like and, and whether it's accreditation based, whether it's going to be the circular uh, definition, which is you must have sufficient expertise and experience um, or, or whether it's going to be something different. I know there have been working parties working on it. Um, so in the absence of that, I can't possibly see how they can bring in legislation on April the 27th without the industry having some time to prepare for it. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. It's one of my favourite things that we do in partnership with Warren and Blackhurst, Bud, because these sessions are really what you make of them. It's We have multiple opportunities for Q, Q &A. They're quite intimate sessions. Um, you can get as many questions in as you need as well. You better watch it on demand. You'll get CPD for attending. So do get your tickets and they're limited, you know, while you can on our website, fsmatters.com and click on the webinars tab. Follow our social media. You'll see it on there. We'll tag Warren in as well, etc. But definitely do come along. So Warren, just before we ride off into the sunset on this edition of the podcast, if people want to get in touch with you or Blackhurst Bud, what's the best way to do so? Uh, I'm fairly prevalent on LinkedIn, Blackhurst Bud Solicitors and then firesafetylaw.co.uk. Uh, I do tweet as well, um, but um, Blackers Bud Solicitors is, is where I practice from. Brilliant. Well, thanks for joining us again, Warren, and really looking forward to the 2nd of June with you. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Returning to
to the news now, and Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, has secured the signatures of the country's biggest house builders on the developer remediation contract, which is being heralded as, and I quote, a major step towards ending the building safety scandal. A total of 39 developers, including the top 10 biggest house builders across the UK, all put pen to paper on an eagerly binding document before the deadline of Monday the 13th of March. And in doing so, irreversibly committed themselves to fix unsafe buildings which they developed or otherwise refurbished. These signatories represent a substantial proportion of the housing market, while the signed agreements will raise at least £2 billion for remediation costs. According to the government, this news will come as a welcome relief for the thousands of innocent leaseholders and tenants whose homes are covered by the contract. Developers themselves will now be legally bound to pay to fix their unsafe buildings, and that eligible developers who fail to sign will not be able to operate freely in the housing market. Following the passing of the contract deadline, Michael Gove commented, and I quote, I've been clear all along that those responsible for this crisis must pay. I'm grateful to those developers who've done the right thing by signing this legally binding document. We will now be monitoring their progress on remediation very closely to ensure this work is completed urgently and safely. For those developers that have taken responsibility, this period offers the chance for a reset such that they can focus on building more of the safe, decent and affordable homes that we so desperately need. In addition, Go warned, to those developers that have failed to sign the contract without good reason, let me be very clear, we are coming for you. If you do not sign, you will not be able to operate freely in the housing market. Your investors will see that your business model is broken. Only responsible developers are welcome here. Further, the Secretary of State noted, this day should not be about developers or indeed about the government. Today is very much about innocent leaseholders. I want to put on record my apology to all leaseholders for the years of misery and hardship they've had to endure. They should never have been ignored, asked to pay or let down in any way. In conclusion, Michael Grove observed, this day marks a turning point and an important step towards resolving this crisis. There's so much more work to be done, of course. From a personal perspective, I will always act to protect leaseholders and seek to end this injustice. So this is a pretty major story again, Mark, and following on from several we've covered in recent podcasts. What's your take on this one? Yeah, and you've actually uh, still been on my thunder there. I was going to say we have covered this on a couple of recent podcasts, and we said that we would follow this story through, and we have, and you know, the deadline has come and gone. I think that the comment that Mr. Gove made that probably resonates with most people listening to this is, we're coming for you. And they have been very staunch, the government, in their stance on this they've made a, a promise of what they're going to do and they and they say they're going to follow it through um you know they have they i use my words carefully here they have been very forceful in getting um building contractors to to sign up to this and they've obviously had a majority of success and uh, i'm not sure that i envy those that haven't signed up to that um because i'm sure the government will follow through with its action of, of chasing them down but the concept remains the same of course brian that People have a right to live in a safe home that, that, that they purchased. And, you know, if work has been carried out unsafely with, you know, major defects, it, it shouldn't be up to them to have to pay for the costs. And, and that is what the government are, are doing here with developers. So I just want to add a little bit more to it from the story. And if you want to read any of these stories that we've spoken about today on the FSM podcast, you can go to our website fsmatters.com use the search box and, and 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 search any of the stories but in this one you'd be looking at the title leading developers sign secretary of state's building safety contract so adding a bit more to it uh Bri, signatories are required to fix all life critical fire safety defects in all english buildings over 11 meters in height in which they've had a role in developing and refurbishing it also requires them to reimburse a taxpayer where government funds have already been paid for remediation, with that money being used to make other buildings safe on a faster basis. For developers who have signed, their obligations begin immediately. Leaseholders will benefit from a common framework of rights and responsibilities that will see their buildings fixed without them having to pay, while developers will be required to inform residents, in effect, buildings on how they will meet these commitments. In due course, the government will publish further information on how developers will be prohibited from carrying out major development or from receiving building control approval unless they sign or adhere to the contract. So that comes back to the one I made earlier of <laughs> they're coming for you, a comment that Mr Gove made. So powers outlined within the Building Safety Act 2022 will be enforced. 
Further, regulations will establish the responsible actors scheme and set out the criteria for eligibility as well as the conditions of membership. Eligible developers who do not sign the contract will not be able to join the responsible actors scheme and will be subject to prohibitions. So, yeah, there you go. That talks about a bit more about the effects. And I don't envy the people that aren't going to sign up to that. The government are very staunch on this. And I think it's something that those people listening, listeners, will, will support in general. And, and I think you can be politically neutral on that, too, to, to do so. So, Brian, I want to move on to our final news story of the day. And this is one I've been hinting at all episode of the podcast and something I am really, really excited to <laughs> announce. It's already out of the public domain, so many of you will have heard of this, but we are finally doing what many of you have asked us to do, and that is a face-to-face -face event. Fire Safety Matters Live is now a thing. It will take place on the 15th of June at the Coventry Building Society Arena in the daytime. And of course, those of you with an eagle eye on the calendar will know the FSM Awards happened that night at the same venue. Um, I'm really excited about this, Brian. Um, we opened registration a week ago and already 50% of the free passes are gone. I would strongly urge anyone that wants to come for free to this event to do so very quickly because passes are going to go like, you know, 50% <laughs> in a week says everything, right? You need to go to fsmlive.co.uk. That is fsmlive.co.uk. And what is it? Well, it's a full day CPD accredited conference. You will get seven hours of CPD for attending. It has a conference that runs and I'll go through what that CPD sessions are in a moment. But you've also got access to over 40 leading brands in the fire safety sector in an exhibition area. You get free parking, free lunch, free tea and coffee, free networking. Everything is free, including Wi-Fi. And it's a perfect place to see the latest innovations in the sector before we even touch the conference content. We've got brands like 3ET, Advanced, Aco, Apollo, BAFE, CTEC, CHSG, Detector Testers, Draeger with their smoke hood, Eaton, EMS, Evacchair, Everlux, FFE, the Fire Industry Association, FIKE. Fire Compliance Plus, Firefly, Fire Hub, Fire Pro UK, Global Fire Equipment, Global HSE Solutions, Hayes, Hi Fire, Kentec, NCAB Group, the National Security Inspectorate, Paytol, SafeLink, Safety Chair, Safety Technology International, SideRise, Siemens, Simpro, SSAIB, who we talked about earlier, TO Fire Safety, Uptick, Vidicon, and Vimpex, you know, like a who's who of uh, the fire safety sector for products and services there. And you know, they'll be showing their, their latest products and wares, but you can also speak face to face to their experts. But then, of course, you also get free access to the conference. And, and we're very proud of the conference sign up, which you will be chairing, Brian. And the opening address will be delivered by the building safety regulator. And that's Mark Wilson, the operational policy lead and planning gateway one for the building safety regulator. We've got a session from Apollo on protecting educational premises from fire. We've got one from Advanced on is your residential building compliant with BS 8629, which I know a lot of you will be interested in. Then we've got Jason Hill, who's a great speaker from TO Fire Safety, talking about the four pillars for digital transformation in the fire industry. We've got Ray Puttick, who is somewhat of a veteran of webinars with us, doing a fire safety regulation update, how to comply and meet post-Grenfell fire protection. Then we've got, because it is something for everyone, we've got Graham Laws from SideRise talking about protecting modern buildings, how to ensure effective compartmentation of curtain wall facades. We've got um, tips on how to power up your fire and security installation business. So if you're an installer, come and see Mark Reese's session on that. We've got fire safety in historic premises from Christopher Dunn and FFE. Then we've got a great partner of ours, Ian Moore, the CEO of the Fire Industry Association, doing a session on defining competence for building a safer future in the sector. We've got a panel session with BAFE, SAIB and NSI on demonstrating fire safety competence, which I'm sure you will be very much looking forward to chairing that panel session. You're well in your element there. We've got Dr. Bob Doherty uh, doing a session on do you have a suitable fire risk assessment? And uh, he's obviously from the Institute of Fire Safety Managers, who I'll come back to in a moment. And then we've got Kate Milford, 
uh, who's from, from ASFP, talking about building competence in a passive fire protection. So this event is going to be swamped. Uh, we have got a co-located event which is already sold out inside 48 hours for the Institute of Fire Safety Managers. They're running their own conference where they've got Warren Spencer, who spoke earlier, doing a session. They've got Dame Judith Hackett talking, Nick Coombs, amongst other. That's completely sold out. I'm afraid you can't have access to that. But you can network with the Institute of Fire Safety Managers delegates because they will be at the venue. They will be there um, networking with the, with the exhibitors and other people there. It really is an industry day, Brian, something that we've been planning for a while. All exhibition space sold out before we even went to, to market with this. So it is a proper industry day for networking, education, and seeing the latest products and services. I'm really excited about it, which I'm sure you can probably tell from, from my voice. It's something I've long wanted us to do. We surveyed our listeners and readers, and they told us they wanted to do it. They told us they wanted to do it in the, in the Midlands area. And that's what we've done. So if you want to come to this, please act fast because once the free places are gone, they are gone. And you can go to fsmlive.co.uk. Now, I know this is a bit more work on your plate here, Brian, but I'm pretty confident you're looking forward to this one too. Absolutely, yeah, Mark. I love chairing conferences and debating in front of the industry. Yes, very much so indeed. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's going to be a busy busy day and uh, you know brian will be your host of festivities uh, going through the conference program so if you've got any questions drop us a line on social media uh, or through the usual channels but do go to fsmlive.co.uk and as i always say brian you don't have to wait for this podcast to see all the latest news prosecutions products and services. you can go to our website and as I said that at the start, I might as well end the news the same way. That is fsmatters.com or just throw into a search engine, Fire Safety Matters and Up We Pop. You've got our upcoming webinars and our back webinars by clicking on the webinars tab there. You can sign up to get the magazine for free, which will also include the annual FIA guide. And you can sign up to get our weekly e-newsletter for free. So plenty of ways to interact with us, including social media. Uh, if you've got any further comments you want to throw to me um, you, or feedback on this podcast, do use the hashtag FSM podcast. But, but also give us a review on the podcast platform of choice. You know, we would very much appreciate a five star review and your feedback. So don't be afraid to do that. So that concludes the news, Brian. And it's now time for you to tell us who's our final guest on this podcast. Our second guest on episode 31 of the Fire Safety Matters podcast is Gary Moffat, Director of Fire and Security in the UK at Chubb. Gary has served the business for close on 20 years now, having graduated from Liverpool John Moores University with a degree in business administration and management. During our interview, Gary focuses on the golden thread of information, how Chubb as an organisation is supporting building owners with compliance, and also the latest evacuation alert systems. Further, Gary references the Fire Safety England Regulations 2022, which of course commenced back in January. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the podcast, Gary. As a business, Chubb enjoys a rich heritage when it comes to the provision of fire safety solutions. Could you provide us with an overview of the fire safety products and solutions that the company provides at present, please? Yeah, of course, Brian. Um, I mean, Chubb's got such a fantastic history. It's a 205-year-old brand, believe it or not, and it's synonymous with innovation, and that's really sustained the passing of time. And we're really passionate about driving the business forward into the future. And one of the ways uh, we're going to do this is by investing our people to give them the best training, the best skills and the support they need to provide the very best service to our customers. So we've now been part of the API group uh, for over a year. And this creates a new chapter for Chubb. Um, it's, it's a new world of opportunity for us to achieve great things. And, and we're putting people at the heart of everything we do. And as part of this, we recently relaunched our new vision, our new mission, and our new values. So our new vision for Chubb is to be the number one trusted partner to protect the world's most valued uh, resources, um, namely people, property, and assets. So with, uh, with, with most of our existing customers, we've already achieved the position of trusted partner in their hearts and minds. But we can't be complacent. We need to continue to serve every customer to the highest level to maintain their deep loyalty to Chubb. Equally, there's potential new customers for Chubb who we want to serve the same high standards and become their trusted partner too. So looking back at Chubb's history, our first innovation in fire safety was the humble fire, fire, fire extinguisher. 
And one of the landmark moments for the business was in 1903, when we became world renowned for the first conical fire extinguisher known as the Minimax. And it's amazing looking back at that to see how far we've come as a business. Um, funny enough, when, when I joined Chubb's graduate scheme back in 2001, um, fire extinguisher servicing was the first job I did. And I did it for six months before moving into sales. But it's really stood me in good stead for the rest of my career, to learn how Chubb works from the ground up and how to really nurture the people. So that's so valuable. In terms of our fire safety uh, solutions portfolio, well, it, it, it's vast. In, es in essence, we provide a one-stop shop solution for all workplace fire safety needs. So that's everything from reliable fire alarms, fire extinguishers and sprinkler systems through the detailed evacuation planning and comprehensive risk assessments and training. So ultimately, our aim is a business to help to create a safe, secure and connected working environment that protect the well-being of everyone. So we're going to achieve this by constantly evolving our solutions to the latest technology and continuously investing in our our teams to ensure our customers receive the best possible advice to make well-informed decisions about their fire safety needs. There's been much talk in recent times, Gary, relating to the golden thread of information for buildings. Could you explain what this is and also what it means for today's building owners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the golden thread, it, it sounds like something you expect to find in your granny's knitting bag, doesn't it? But um, joking aside, uh, the golden thread, it's, it's, it, it's important when it comes to building safety practices. In the simplest uh, of terms, the golden thread is the information that allows someone to understand the building and keep it safe, and it's, and, and it's the management of that information surely to ensure it's easily ac accessible and understandable, accurate, and kept up to date. Um, it came about following the terrible Grenfell Tower tragedy, which brought light the urgent need for an improved building regulations for fire safety. Uh, this led to the Government Commission Dame Judith Hackett's uh, report entitled Building Safer Future. On the back of that report, the government enforced an update to the 1984 Building Safety Act, and this included the reduction of the golden thread. So building owners are now required to keep a joined up digital paper trail of documentation, including fire risk assessments, evacuation plans and maintenance records throughout the building's life cycle, from design and construction to occupation and beyond. So this documentation is then passed upon the sale of the building, ensuring that all owners and occupants have access to up-to-date and relevant fire safety information. In fact, the legislation states that the information should be accessible not only to owners and residents, but also to relevant authorities and fire safety officers. So whilst the Golden Thread Protocol was introduced to drive improved safety, it uh, promotes accountability too. It implements the need to keep a record of, of who makes changes and decisions, when they make them, and with all information stored digi digitally for ease of access. And following on from that, Gary, how is Chubb supporting building owners with their own Golden Thread compliance at the moment? Well, the legislative landscape is it, it, it's pretty complex and it can be difficult for building owners and duty, duty care holders to navigate. But this is where Chubb comes in. Um, we've got vast knowledge and expertise and we help our customers mitigate fire risks while ensuring they, remain, they, they, they do remain, remain compliant. And we'll play an important role in Golden Thread compliance, easing some of the pressures facing building owners. Uh, for instance, the legislation specifies that all documents stored is structured digital information as outlined by the government. So at Chubb, we adhere to such fire safety laws by supplying documentation that fulfills legal parameters, um, offering our clients clear guidance on what is needed to comply with the Golden Thread. One example of this is the inclusion of relevant installation instructions, maintenance schedules and test results in the correct digital format. This not only serves as crucial reference for material for the Golden Thread, but also enables building owners and duty holders to keep internal documentation of the products and services that, that they're investing in. So keeping up to date with new legislation that affects existing maintenance protocols can be overwhelming for building owners. And this is something we're well aware of at Chubb. So in working with us, we can help our clients understand how the new frameworks affect their businesses and how best to change working practices to facilitate compliance. Now, last year, Chubb launched an evacuation alert system for high-rise buildings. We covered that launch on the Fire Safety Matters website, in fact. Could you outline some more detail about this new system for us, Gary? Yeah, of course. Um, so it was just over a year ago that we introduced the evacuation alert system to our fire safety portfolio. And that was to assist the UK's fire and rescue services in safely evacuating residential buildings over 18 metres tall. So this was in response to the new code of practice recommendations outlined within British Standard 8629, which focuses on the design, installation, commissioning and maintenance of evacuation alert systems. 
So our system is designed to facilitate immediate evacuation of any floor within a building to securely phase the evacuation process and provide the highest levels of tenant and asset protection. Um, how it works is the system's operating panel is housed within a tamper-proof enclosure that can only be opened by a patented and key mechanism that conforms to the British standard 1303 for locks. So the toggles in the panel are really easy to use, so the fire and rescue services can instantly activate the alarm sounders. The system's LED indicators also provide a clear overview of the evacuation status in each zone, so evacuation strategies can be implemented quickly and safely. So our evacuation alert system is suitable for both new build and retrofit applications and offers hybrid uh, network capabilities, given owners uh, the flexibility to tailor the system to, to meet their specific needs. The system can also be continuously upgraded and extended to meet future legislation updates. The flexibility of the system doesn't stop there, though. Um, it also allows building owners to wirelessly interlink individual alarm sounders and visual alarm devices to the hardwired evac evacuation alert control panel. Once the system's installed, we then obviously provide proof of testing upon handover, in addition to ongoing testing to provide complete peace of mind. Whilst having, it's worth saying that whilst having an evacuation alert system installed in every tall building is essential for keeping building occupants safe, planning for a safe eva evacuation is equally as important. Changing nature of emergencies um, as, as, as time goes on and the unique challenges of uh, different building designs means we're seeing a growing need for tailor-made emergency plans as no one solution fits all buildings. So high-rise buildings in particular need careful consideration. The requirement to evacuate large numbers of people across multiple floors whilst coordinate the process swiftly and calmly requires a bespoke solution that, that no stone remains unturned at the planning stage. At CHOP, we've got a seven-step rule when, uh, we're, we're, when regarding emergency evacuation planning, and we don't consider no plan complete until we've considered and addressed every single step. So these steps include fire prevention methods, uh, devices to detect potential dangers, methods to control, uh, contain and suppress fires, an early warning evacuation alert system, clear and concise evacuation rules, and obviously the occupant understanding of the instructions, and adequate exit and escape route options. So in, in the words of kind of Benjamin Franklin, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, and it couldn't be truer when it comes to planning uh, for a safe evacuation. And finally, Gary, in January of this year, the government commenced the all new Fire Safety England Regulations 2022. How exactly do these new regulations affect today's building owners, in your view? Um, overall, the new regulations they do represent a significant shift in the responsibility for fire safety from the fire and rescue services to the building owners, impo imposing new obligations and responsibilities on them to ensure the safety of their buildings in the event of a fire. So under the new regulations, building owners are responsible for carrying out fire risk assessments and ensuring that appropriate fire safety measures are in place to protect occupants, visitors, and the building itself. This includes having an up-to-date fire evacuation plan, providing fire alarms and extinguishers, and ensuring that fire doors and fire escapes are properly maintained. Another requirement is that building owners must appoint a responsible person to ensure that fire safety measures are adequate and that the building is being managed in accordance with fire safety regulations. So the, the, the concept of a responsible person isn't a new one. It was uh, introduced as part of the regulatory reform Fire Safety Order 2005, which governs the day-to-day -day fire safety. In the context of the new regulations, though, the responsible person is the person who is responsible for the safety of themselves and the others who use the regulated premises. Where this is usually the building owner, in residential buildings, it will also include any other person in control of the common parts or the exterior of the, of the premises. So the updated fire safety regulations also impose different rules on building owners according to the makeup of their building. So the, the full list of requirements for each building type is, is, is far too long for me to recite right now. But in summary, buildings have been classed into three categories. So the first is owners of non-high rise buildings are required to provide fire safety instructions to residents. The second is owners of buildings over 11 metres are required to perform annual checks of fire doors. Owners of buildings over 18 metres tall must install and maintain a secure information box in the building, provide fire safety information on fire doors and undertake regular checks of them, undertake monthly checks on all lifts in the building, as well as uh, providing electronic floor plans to the fire and rescue service. Um, and you can find a full list of the requirements on the gov.uk website. But like any new legislation, navigating through the new requirements and working out what applies to you can be daunting. And this is something we'll fully appreciate at Chubb. 
So we are one of the UK's leading fire safety solution providers, and we are well placed to provide accurate and up-to-date information on the fire safety of a building, allowing the necessary preventative measures to be taken to ensure the absolute safety of everyone in the building. brings us to the end of episode 31 of the Fire Safety Matters podcast. Many thanks indeed to our guests on this edition, namely Warren Spencer from Blackhurst Bud Solicitors and Gary Moffat of Chubb Fire and Security. You can read more on the issues raised in this edition of the podcast and others by visiting the Fire Safety Matters website. The web address you need to access is www.fsmatters.com. We do hope you enjoyed the content delivered in the podcast and found it informative. Please do contact us if there are any particular themes or issues you would like us to explore on upcoming editions. You can do so on Twitter by using the hashtag FSM podcast. On that note, do make sure you follow us on Twitter at FSMatters underscore MAG and also access our LinkedIn page at Fire Safety Matters magazine and website. Please do like and share the content of our regular podcasts and spread the word among your industry colleagues. You can listen to the Fire Safety Matters podcast for free on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube or Podbean. All you need to do is enter the term Fire Safety Matters into your chosen platform search box. We'll see you next time.